dude, you're kind of the Alex Hormozzi that the internet hasn't found out about yet. Um, I, that, I'm going to take that as a compliment, honestly. But... <laughs> and let's just talk numbers, right? You, you 86 somebody's uh, revenue, right? You took them from 360,000 a year to making 31 million a year and then exited right. to a billion dollar company, right? How does someone who works with his family transition into growing businesses at this level? We are here with uh, Jose Servino. I am very, very happy to have this sit down, this conversation uh, with Jose. Um, I took a look at his work and it's a bit mind blowing. You're, dude, you're kind of the Alex Hormozzi that the internet hasn't found out about yet. <laughs> Um, I, that, I'm going to take that as a compliment, honestly, but <laughs> you should, yeah, <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, he is a, he's a guy, he's a, he's a virtual mentor of mine. Um, but I have to really give a lot of thanks and credit to Roland Frazier, who honestly has uh, given me permission to use a lot of his work. So it's, it is thanks to Roland Frazier, if anything. Interesting. You know what? I've actually never heard of Roland Frazier. Maybe we can talk a bit about his uh, his work. I'd be happy to, honestly. It's it's amazing. Awesome. But before we do, I want to learn more about you because there's not much out there online about you. Um, and I'm happy to be one of the first to kind of spread uh, your your story. Tell us a bit about, you know, your origin story. Like, how did you become... The entrepreneur you are today yeah um let's see if i can keep this as brief as possible so all right so basically i was born to immigrant parents who basically were entrepreneurs from the start right mm -hmm. uh, and growing up i basically saw them make a life out of it and you know plot their own course and i grew inspired to basically do the same um, yeah. since a young age it's always been a dream of mine to become an entrepreneur and over the years um, going from one, you know, discipline to the other, always learning and accumulating, compounding my skills. Um, I'm finally at a point where I feel like I can start to strike out on my own and really contribute to the world. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, my dad also, you know, he's been an entrepreneur since 95. So it's a huge inspiration to have one in the family in that sense, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm actually third generation entrepreneur now. I started oh. with my, yeah, I started with my, God, with my grandmother. Interesting. Well, like, what were the businesses like? Was it like a family business that started with your grandmother, or did each generation have a different business? Each generation had its own business. So my grandmother, um, I mean, my story, you know, starts with my with my parents and with her story. Um, my grandmother, she she lost her husband, my my grandfather, when my father was about seven years old. So she was kind of forced into, into entrepreneurship. And what she did was basically arbitrage. Mm -hmm. So in her local town, in her local area, she was basically the, the lead merchant in a lot of ways. She would have, yeah. you know, the best cheeses, the best um, food products and, and, you know, household items. And people would buy her from her and she would actually license or quote unquote license them out. That's basically the, the model that she would use um, to other people. So then she'd, make money even when other merchants are selling their products for lower and so on. That's cool. That's a very smart business model, right? Even, you know, back then, like royalties, get paid yeah. for royalties for cheese. Basically, <laughs> I mean, it wasn't just cheese, but but basically. Um, and, and then my father, basically, he went into real estate. He did his own general contracting business. So he would um, build and and purchase and you know, now he maintains buildings mm -hmm. uh, and my mother she was a real estate agent uh, and then she started her own cleaning business and now she has a number of clients in the general county so a lot of small businesses i think i was the first one to really start to say okay what's the next step what's the next level uh, and then that's why i went into tech and that's why i i wanted to do tech entrepreneurship i wanted to do digital entrepreneurship and I don't see that's the road that I'm on right now. You mentioned on, on your LinkedIn that you started by working in your family's business. Tell tell us a bit about that. Sure. So basically, like I said before, there's the real estate business and then there's the cleaning business. Uh, I basically help operate and control the finances of the business. Mm -hmm. And that's mostly to afford my parents an early retirement. 
um, there is this issue in a lot of businesses and business owners or business operators, they tend to run into this a lot. It's that they they become the operators. They're working in the business instead of on the business. Yep. And because of that, they get stuck in this yep. freedom trap in a lot of ways. Uh, so, so what I'm doing for them is I'm helping solve that by becoming the operator or the semi-operator and delegating out. Um, and then that's essentially what I'm bringing to the table for a lot of entrepreneurs uh, in mm -hmm. the digital space and elsewhere uh, with with Serino Enterprises. That's dope. Um, I actually had this conversation with my father back when I was like 23. It was exactly in the situation that you were talking about, you know, like working all the time, always exhausted, always burned out, thinking about selling the business. But like, think of it, think of it this way, like the Romanian entrepreneur mindset back in, you know, the 2000s, he wasn't thinking of selling the business as a money producing machine, like selling the, the because he makes like concrete tubes and uh, building blocks, right? Just selling the equipment. And... I I sat down and, you know, I, I told my dad, you know, the, the problem is not the business. The problem is you. Coming from me, like, like I had no business experience, but I saw what the entrepreneurs were doing, right? And I said, your job is to look at the business as a whole and make adjustments as a, like a control panel, not to always be the employee in your own business. It took my dad a year for the sensei to sink in but it right. changed everything for him. Now he has freedom. You know, he bought like uh, a house close to the mountains. You know, he can travel whenever. He actually sold the business. He properly sold the business last year. So awesome. what I'm looking to say is that your work is exceptionally important because I just, I saw that with my own father. Yeah, yeah. And, and the thing is that sometimes... It takes years, like you said, it takes years for entrepreneur entrepreneur to realize to not work in the business, work on the business. And then there's a very small percentage of entrepreneurs who realize that they can start to work above the business as well. Mm. That work even work on the business and being on the work chart is what yep. limits their overall talent and potential. Yes. Imagine just imagine being able to to apply your your entrepreneurial talent to multiple businesses at a time, creating an empire creating an, an, an economy of your own mm -hmm. right i mean that's a completely different level of, of level of entrepreneurship that people can reach but i mean so few can so few even realize yeah yeah a hundred percent a hundred percent it's like when, when you step back and you can look at the bigger picture that's when you use the majority of your resources that you're not really tapping into um and let's right. just talk numbers right you you 86th somebody's uh, revenue, right? You took them from 360,000 a year to making 31 million a year and then exited right. to a billion dollar company, right? How does someone who uh, works with his family transition into, you know, growing businesses at this level? That's a really good question. That's a really good case study. So it depends on the type of business, of course. Um, if you're an, a brick and mortar, then there's always the franchising model, right? Mm -hmm. You can always franchise the business. And what that does is it starts to, like you said earlier, it start you start to look at the business as a, basically a product of its own, as a yeah. system of its own, something, something that can be rec, you know, replicated across the country in different areas and still work. Um, that is probably the best way for a brick and mortar, brick and mortar business to, to scale to that level. Now, how do you do it at that pace, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you need basically a meta system for how to go about the, the scaling process, right? Um, and it really comes down to being able to analyze for the key growth markers, right? For it's a, just called make KPIs, right? So you focus on the right KPIs, you analyze for them, and then you focus on them. You focus on them and streamline around them. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give you an example because that's very high level. So uh, let's say you have three products, um, each doing a certain amount of revenue each and get, giving you a certain amount of profit margin. So in this sort of meta process, if you were to apply it to these three products, what you would actually have to do is you'd have to analyze which one is giving you the highest profit to the, high, to the largest target market, right. right? And then essentially, even if it's, even if the other two products are 20 
to 30% of overall revenue, or even maybe 50% of overall revenue, there's still one product, that's 50% of your revenue, and right. maybe even 50% of your profit. Focus on that one, identify what what's really resonating with the target avatar that, that you're targeting with that profit, with that, sorry, with that product, and then you scale that one. And mm -hmm. it's that constant, constant systematic process of, all right, which, what is working, what isn't, and just do more of what's working and less of what isn't. Mm -hmm. Now that's principle number one right. to, for scaling to that level. Principle number two is what I mentioned earlier about working on a business. No, not working on a business, excuse me, working above, above the a business. business. Mm -hmm. So, all right, so what does that mean? That essentially means getting off the org chart, not being the CEO anymore, but being somebody, something more of like a board member, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at that level, where you have somebody else driving the business, where you can step away for maybe even like a year or two and have the business still grow without you. At that point, what you can start doing is you can start looking at what we call the seven different areas or what's something called an acquisition wheel, seven different areas where you can target for, uh, for acquisitions. And what we do is we do $0 out of pocket M&A acquisitions, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and we use 200 different strategies for that. So the way to get to that 86 X is essentially to start looking at your expenses in these different areas right. and purchase with zero dollars out of your pocket, the businesses that you're relying on to accomplish those, those expenses. Interesting. Right? Very, very interesting. Right. So you're basically buying your suppliers. Right. And right. you're cutting and 200 different ways to do it. It's, it's insane. Interesting. Interesting. Like, I guess the only one that comes to my mind right now, because it's a bit foreign to me, uh, just getting a big ass loan and, uh, you know, using the bank's money instead, but I'm sure that that's probably one of the 200. It is, it is, uh, you can, you can leverage, it's all about negotiation, right? And it really mm -hmm. depends on what type of deal you're, you're dealing with. If it's a broker led deal, then it becomes a bit more difficult, but if it's an off-market deal, which is what we specialize in 33 different ways to actually find these off-market deals, you can then start to negotiate these terms. You can do something like a deferred down payment on the first 20% of a total 100% loan. Mm. Um, then you can figure out how to pay the other 80% off. It can be maybe something like an earn out or an earn in, which is basically different ways of structuring the upside of the, of the business post acquisition. So then the original owner can mm -hmm. get some of that upside and then they, they're more lenient with the with the terms of the agreement, you can do something like a carve out, right? You can carve actual assets out of the business that you're trying to acquire. So if you're a brick and mortar business uh, and you're and there's a ton of equipment like your father, you can actually carve the equipment out of the total acquisition cost. Mm -hmm. And then you're basically only acquiring the core operations of the business right. that 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 you need to make the, the the acquisition run. And you can lease back the real estate, you can lease back the equipment to the to the company and mm -hmm. then that's actually a negotiating tactic you could say okay um this original entrepreneur they still want some money coming in right well right. they still own the the equipment we'll lease the equipment from from the entrepreneur and they'll still get some kickback from, from the acquisition that's cool. so they're, they're just, just gotta be creative with these things yeah that's that's exactly the uh the word that was coming to my mind it's creativity you know I'm thinking about it, like one of my clients actually did the same thing. He bought one of his suppliers for this exact reason. Now I just rem remember uh, this this fact. That's awesome. Um, you know, I was joking saying that you're the Alex Hormozzi that the internet hasn't found out about, but really like these are very, very solid principles that I noticed that the high level people really live by. Just like you said, focus on the one thing, get laser focused on the one that's the biggest profit driver kill your other babies and that leaves their focus like that's it's makes magic i guess right right but there are so many other tools and frameworks that you can use yeah right and so many different other ways to go about it i mm -hmm. mean we have what seems to be maybe 100 plus different tools in our toolbox uh, right. to grow these businesses to audit these these systems um but here's here's another one this is a this is bezos inspired um turning your teams into profit centers, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if you already have a team built out and you can't acquire a team or acquire a business, well then yep. why not, why not actually, if they have a core 
the deliverable, let's say like a content generation business, like a content mm -hmm. generation team, well, you can actually sell their services to other businesses, right? You can yeah. put them mm -hmm. under one entity, mm -hmm. spin them off. Mm -hmm. You still pay them. They're still doing yeah. your work, but now they're making you money with other entrepreneurs in their free time. Mm -hmm. So many different ways. Assuming that their, you know, that their work has been very uh, streamlined and they all of a sudden have more time, right? Or maybe you just hire more team members basically to become that profit right. generator, basically. Awesome. So what I also wanted to know, like, how did you make the transition, you know, from working with your family to doing this? Right. So it was basically a up and down process over two years. Um, mm -hmm. The pandemic hit, I was working as a software engineer for an AI agency, working with 172, one of these Wall Street hedge funds. And, uh, and basically I had to, I had to then start working on the business. My father got trapped in Spain um, during the pandemic. So he got, during the lockdowns, he had to stay over there for a year and a half. And there were, there was business to be done over here. So I started working on, on his business um, and my mother's as well, because I mean, things were, it's a cleaning business. It's with all the pandemic, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of cleaning that needed to be done. Yeah. Um, less sanitizing. So. So that was basically the start of the process. Um, I still worked, tried my best to work um, other businesses. I started my own business, got that to half a million in the first couple of months, uh, then went back to to working with my parents again uh, because they really needed it. But my, my father got cancer, so I had to take a step mm. back again. I'm um, sorry to hear that. And, but he, he's completely cancer free now, so it's a, it's a happy ending. Um, <laughs> That's yeah. That should be a conversation for another podcast interview. I should have your dad on too. Yeah, yeah, um, that that would be an interesting, interesting interview. Um, Beautiful. But yeah, I mean, long story short, just to just to say, it it was through that process of trying to manage and maintain my parents' businesses, start my own businesses, and and then honestly start other people's businesses. There was this MIT MBA founder um, that I helped launch his platform. Um, it was a zero to one platform. Really interesting. I'd love to talk about it later on. Just to sure to share this. It's a you know, world changing, uh, you know, business. But long story short, this is that that was the process. Just inch by inch, starting and stopping, and eventually deciding like, you know, this is the direction I really want to go in. Mm -hmm. For some reason, for some reason, my my life is going this way. This direction is going this way, and I just need to follow it. Um, and I just. Go right in deep. I found Roland Frazier. I found his work. I joined, you know, him and his team in a lot of ways, and and now I'm just drinking from the fire hose in a lot of ways, trying to level up to 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 be the best entrepreneur possible. Interesting, interesting. That's a very interesting story. Um, before we talk about Roland, what what do you see the differences between? scaling a brick and mortar we touched a bit of uh upon that and scaling a digital business right so a brick and mortar is much more difficult to scale mm -hmm. first and foremost because you have because you have you know physical assets and labor to to account for and that's limited by geographic area in a lot of in most cases um but so that's a that's for brick and mortar business. For digital businesses, they have the scalability of the internet. It doesn't have to be a SaaS company. That's one of those key, diff, you know, um, breakthrough thoughts, right? It doesn't have to be a SaaS company. You don't have to build a software to right. tap into the the internet to scale the internet. You really just need to have digital assets. So mm -hmm. that can be eBooks and you know, like a podcast, coaching business, consulting. All what you name it, um, and the difference there is primarily that you can tap into social media platforms. You could you aren't limited by geographic area and talent. The talent that you need to you know fulfill services or to scale your business are all remote. You can get remote salespeople, remote marketers, remote VAs. Everything you need is decentralized in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you see being the like the main challenge in terms of scaling? Is it ad costs? Is it optimizing the offer? Is it killing the uh, you know not so profitable services? 
Like, what do you see, or is it just the mindset of the business owner? It's a good question. So, I mean, I think it really depends on where they are in that scaling process. Mm -hmm. If you're in the very beginning, below 500,000 a, a year, uh, that is mostly a focusing issue and a right. mindset issue. You're still becoming the entrepreneur that is capable of doing the seven figures. Uh, then from there, and, and you know, in that process, there's always like focusing on one offer, focusing on one avatar, focusing on one channel uh, until you get to, to the seven figures. And then at that point, it's like, okay, then it's a mindset shift again, where are you going to, how are you going to better serve your target market? How do you diversify if possible, and then expand your profit margin. Um, and, and this is one of those points where I tend to see entrepreneurs, seven figure entrepreneurs who feel like they've really proven themselves and they've gotten to a great milestone, right? Seven figures, it's something to be proud of. Right. Um, but that's when they start to say, okay, I can start a second business or I can start a third or fourth business at the same time. Yeah. And, and honestly, that, 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 uh, that splits their focus even if they're talented enough to do it, it splits their focus. And it, and instead of having one multiple eight figure business, which is what they're capable of, they're, if they're capable of seven, they can get to the multiple eight. Um, they then, instead of having that, they have like two or three kind of high six figure, low seven figure businesses. It's a fraction of what they're of, of what's possible for them and what they're capable mm -hmm. of. Um, that's a bit of a tangent, but back to, back to the point, it's all about mindset about focus yep. and then from there it's about offer and and channels and so on and you, you just add those on over time and you optimize all along the way interesting interesting i think for a lot of them is it's the you know i've been doing this for such a long time i feel like if i don't do something new i'm going to kill myself so what what do you say to somebody being in that state of mind that there's plenty of variety in your business as it is. If you're if you're looking for variety elsewhere, then you aren't maximizing your current opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Really, there's so much inside of their business, and they they're barely tapping into the service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and definitely that's the value of having someone uh, you know look at the business externally because you know you can see a lot of the things that the entrepreneurs can see you know um and this is one of them it's like okay but right. you can get variety from here from here have you thought about this and it's like no beautiful yeah and, and that's honestly the, exactly what we do like when was the last time for any entrepreneur listening like when was the last time you had somebody sit down with you for half a day to just talk about the business mm. you're working in the business getting things done 24 7 like when was the last time you really thought about the business at at a thirty thousand foot view, full strategy, like rarely, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's what we that's what we do. We make Most it possible for them to do that. Most entrepreneurs don't, and sometimes you know, even if you do sit and think about the business, you still can't see the whole bigger picture. Um, I mean, in, I see this of, of course with uh, some of my clients, but even with my own father, you know, it took him a year to get that insight of, okay, I need to delegate. But he hired someone who was a, a tax expert. And she kind of optimized a lot of the business for him because he just couldn't do it by himself, right? So yeah, definitely sit down and think, but just don't be the only one at the table. Right. right. Beautiful. Um, tell us a bit about Roland and uh, his work. Sure. So he he's a he's a myth and a legend in a lot of ways. Um, mm -hmm. So Roland, he he's the originator of the zero dollar out of pocket M and A strategies um, mm -hmm. that can that really are the core of eighty six xing your business in a couple of years. Um, he did a thousand plus acquisitions and exits. He grew, I think, it's six or seven companies to a hundred million dollars a year, which is unheard of. Um, mm -hmm. and then I think about as many onto the Inc fastest growers, fastest growing company, uh, mm -hmm. list. Uh, so he was a, he's a former lawyer, um, who went into M and a, who he, he's, 
he basically focused on M and A as a lawyer, and then he he learned everything possible, and then he transitioned into becoming full time entrepreneur. And honestly, like his his work, his tools are groundbreaking if you were to apply them to a business. The question, because I'm not very familiar with his work, like because this is a common question, especially in the consulting space, right? Did he uh, exit his own business and did he follow that process for himself or did he jump straight into consulting and just made a killing? So, so like I said earlier, it was it's a thousand acquisitions and exits. Um, so he didn't, he bought his first business. I think it was a manufacturing business. Mm-hmm. I think it might have been steel manufacturing. I don't quote me on that, but he he acquired his first business using right. these strategies, and then from there he he grew the he grew it, exited, and repeated the process, and then just scaled to the point where now he's I think uh, uh, one of the speakers on Tony Robbins' Business Mastery stage. It's interesting. Yeah, he's he's big. Granted, when I first heard of him, when I first came across him on on the internet, I didn't know who he was. But then yeah. you, you read through, and it's just like mind blowing. Yeah, it's like one of those things. Like uh, Lamborghini isn't doesn't have an ad on TV because the people who buy Lamborghini don't watch TV, right? Like the right people know about this uh, guy, I'm sure, right? Um, right. Beautiful. What would you say was the biggest lesson that you you learned from him? Biggest lesson I've learned so far. Roland tends to be right, if not is always right. Um, and a lot of the advice that he gives to me and to the other entrepreneurs under his wing, like it, we we always get headstrong, right? Like your father, after a year of after a year, understanding that he has to get out of the business, we like all entrepreneurs, they they have to be headstrong in order to, in order to survive. Yeah. But but sometimes it's good to just take a step back and really listen, and bring in you know really be open to the wisdom that he brings to the table because it it changes things. Um, but I guess me, for me personally, um, it's, it's this idea of streamlining and maximizing Mm -hmm. the the core drivers of a business and the core drivers of life as well. Mm -hmm. How so? Tell us a bit about how does that apply to, to life? Well, well, think about it this way. If let's say in a relationship, um, if you're doing a lot of small things, they all get results, right? But there are going to be a few core things that you do that get you the majority of the results. Yeah. Just do more of those and mm-hmm. do less of everything else because everything else tends to be a distraction. Focus on what drives the results. Interesting. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so make a, a chart of how many uh, of what nice things you do with them for your wife and how much sex you get and then optimize <laughs> if that if that is your kpi like conversion rate then yes beautiful <laughs> everybody's uh taking out a sheet of paper and uh, a pen right now making the diagram <laughs> <laughs> right beautiful um, what were some of the mindset shifts and uh, identity shifts that you've made for yourself in in your career? I think, hmm, I think the biggest one has been to really take on the identity of an entrepreneur. Um, I, in order to really start my career, I had to be an, an employee, right, and that has its own set of habits, its, its own container of sorts. And in order to really expand and, and go to where, where I wanted to go, where I needed to go, I had to take on a larger identity of an entrepreneur and all the beliefs therein, right? Like um, like always getting the results, always over, always over delivering, um, always finding a way to win, no matter mm-hmm. what, somehow, some way, um, accepting the fact that that when you're in the ring, right, you're most you're most likely going to die. That that sounds kind of morbid. Sounds kind of crazy, but I mean, ninety seven percent. I think it's ninety seven percent of small businesses, at least in the U.S., they 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 die within the first five to ten years. Um, and even then, the, the, the lasting three percent, they they're rarely thriving. 
right? Yes. Very small percentage actually thrive. So it's understanding that when, I, when we play this game, that the likelihood of success is very small uh, and and that's just how it has to be. Mm -hmm. But if not, it would be worth it. Yeah. That's a big part of my, um, because my system is called the warrior shaman mindset. That's a big part of the warrior mindset. Yep. Being prepared really to die. And you know, when, when you hear somebody else say it, it really sounds crazy, but yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like what Elon Musk says, um, looking into the abyss and, and crunching down on glass, something like that. Something like that. I, I see it a bit differently in the sense that, um, you know, I've had this experience to an extent, you know, when, uh, in terms of fighting, but the the most dangerous fighter is the one who is prepared to die because when you are prepared to to die or to fail or whatever you know um that's when you're free hmm. because whenever it's like you, you think about am i going to get punched am i going to get punched am i going to get punched guess what happens right <clears throat> you get stiff and you get sloppy but when you're like yeah give me your best shot and you're free and like you use your full resources you kind of it's kind of a, a step back an energetic step right. back if you will in business that's like it, it's the, the emotional component to business from how i see it it's it's not the fear of failing as much for most entrepreneurs it's the fear of embarrassment of i did my best to make this thing work and it didn't work and all of my friends are gonna laugh but all of your friends don't give a fuck about your business or they just want to hang out and have a coffee. Right. Right. Granted, granted, you know, the, the right people are, aren't really going to care. Um, and then all the people who are, you know, the wrong people, they're, they're going to laugh. They're going to mock you. They're going to think less of you, but they're going to think less of you one way or another. Honestly. Yeah. 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 Always beautiful. Um, yeah, this is a powerful, powerful component of having that level of, of freedom of being okay with with failing um, and definitely embodying the entrepreneur, the the business owner. Um, what is your process? Because I know that a lot of, especially in the coaching consulting space and also entrepreneurs, you know, we're always looking to connect and network with people at a higher level. And I noticed you mainly work with uh, businesses at six, seven figures, right? What's your process of creating this type of business with uh, people at that level, if you can share? Right. I mean, so in the six-figure range, it's usually a process of streamlining and, and focusing, right? Then dialing in on that core offer that really launches you to seven and, and you know, focusing on the channels. Uh, but then at seven figures, it's really about professionalizing the business, getting in operators that can do the majority of the in-house work for you, mm -hmm. and then uh, finding the next level opportunities, whether that be acquisitions or a new product line um, or or maximizing the current offer and, and mm -hmm. figuring out better ways to market it. It's, mm -hmm. it's, all, it's all basically what we do is more of like a one-on-one -on -one process. Um, you're going to find going to find offers out there and consulting practices that give you general kind of consultations for any any business but um, and then you get these coaching programs as well which are basically like cookie cutter for a lot of people but what, what we do differently and what we really pride ourselves in is working one-on-one -on -one with an entrepreneur listening mm -hmm. to them analyzing researching for them um, right. and keeping them on as long-term partners in, in an effort to professionalize the business and always bringing our own specialization to the table so like for me um, you know, I have tech in my background, Google, Wall Street, and, and hiring and managing teams. What I bring to the table is basically the tech SaaS uh, potential, right, for a lot of these businesses. And that's something that most most coaching programs, most consultants, they can't offer that because they don't have the actual experience. Like, how do you actually technically set up the data or extract the data from the current operations, turn it into a data lake that can then be turned into a SaaS product. That's something that's very, very rare 
and it's something that yep. we that we find ourselves in. Cool. So that's that's a very powerful differentiator, and I'm happy that you're leading with uh with that. Um, what I was wondering is like, what's your process in terms of attracting these clients for like attracting the right clients for your business? It all comes down to messaging. Mm -hmm. Um, and honestly, what we focus on, we, we do, we do do consultations and that is one entry point into the overall service ladder, but we also have a, an inverse entry point where, and this is what we focus on. We focus on acquisition. So we focus on finding businesses who are open to speaking to an investor. Um, right. And and then from there, it's all about, you know, where is their, where is their mind at? Um, what's going on in the business? And are they a proper acquisition target? And if not, then it turns into a consulting deal. Um, and finding them, it's really just a matter of, like for us, well, we're focusing on digital entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And right now we're focusing on, focusing on the high ticket space, right? Um, so we're investing in businesses in this area, uh, helping coaches transform themselves if, if need be. But we don't really do like the the mindset work, like what like what you do, um, and we don't do really do those those type of coaching programs. What we do is like the one on one consultations to so really turn them into professional CEOs, professional entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of how we go about it, um, just focusing on a niche and and talking to them and and really seeing whether it's a good fit or not. Awesome. And do the majority of them come from LinkedIn or how do you generate the business? Right. So right now it's mostly LinkedIn, mm -hmm. LinkedIn, cold outreach, um, and then basically warm organic. Um, it's also, we also have a email system uh, up and running. It's getting up and running at least at the moment um, where we do mass cold outreach using uh, GPT, for uh, basically customized uh, templates uh, based off of a GPT-4 mm -hmm. customized avatar. Um, yeah. And and we also do, we're also starting basically a B2C uh, offer, like entry point offer, where we transform an entrepreneur's life and then like in other ways, health and relationships and so on, and then transfer them or upsell them into uh, larger, like higher scale uh, you know, offers. Um, and that's usually on Facebook and Instagram, mostly Facebook. And Facebook tends to be a really good um, lead farm in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah in many ways. I, I actually prefer it over Instagram and I, even LinkedIn. Yeah, it's a powerful platform still in, so. in many ways. And uh, what would you like... How do you generally, because I imagine you also interview a client before, uh, you know, starting to work with them, right? Right. Who is the, who is the hell yes client for you? And that you're like, you're like, yeah, with, with this person, I can really do some magic. Um, usually people who, usually ambitious entrepreneurs who have a larger vision in mind, but don't tend to have the tools or skill set just yet. Um, but the ambition is really the core driver of that, of that hell yes, what client, mm -hmm. because they need, they need to be ambitious. They need to not be burnt out, right. In order to, in order to really invest in themselves and do the work that's necessary to get everything done. Sometimes yep. and it's unfortunate, but sometimes entrepreneurs, they, and a lot of times they, they burn out and they stay in the business and then they just basically accept stagnation. And we have a way of helping those people, but those people tend to be very difficult to, to convince otherwise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In what way? Well, when, when you're used to something, when you're used to something not growing, yep. not having very many opportunities, you can, you can come to the table and say, hey, like I'm a, like, a million-dollar opportunity for you. Like I can, I can, with just one free hour of consultation, I can basically solve your biggest business problem. Right. Right. And, and they'll be like, they'll be a bit open to it, but they already, they're, they're already feeling helpless. So any mm -hmm. sort of, you know, flicker of hope, they extinguish it just because they don't, they don't believe. Mm -hmm. And we, I can't, 
spend all my time and energy making people believe in themselves again. I yeah. want them to, I want to, but at the end of the day, like I, that thing that may have anything that's your specialty, right? Yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's a bit of an art form in a sense, you know, not to uh, blow smoke, smoke my, up my own ass, but in many, many ways, it's more of, it has a lot more to do with the fear of being more successful than the fear of being, uh, uh, you know, just leaving things just the way they are. You know, um, I saw that with my father as well, you know, after a certain point when he got comfortable, it's like, you know, what, do you, what are your plans with your business? You know, I was asking him like a few years ago, I just wanted to stay the same. Just let it be the same. And I was like, you know, it's not going to stay the same, but I couldn't tell, you know, I couldn't say anything, you know, to, to him back then. But yeah, we, it's the comfort of, of, yeah, all my needs are met. Why should I work harder to reach another level? So that's where the ambition component comes in. And the fear of, okay, if I'm going to reach another level, I have to work even harder, but they don't know that they're not fully leveraging their business. They, they're not using every uh, asset that they have available. And that's where you come in. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the ways we, we, ways we, we service our, our clients. Um, the truth is like at the end of the day, we, we, we can all, we can show them the way, but they have to be the ones to execute on it. Yeah, you know, we have partners. We have people that we can bring to the table to really do everything for them. But it's up to them to say yes, and that yeah. habit of saying yes instead of saying no, like that's that's the breakthrough that has to happen before we would come to the table. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and believing that you know, like the next level is actually working less, not working more. Right, and that's what people don't tend to realize. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Um, if you would like to, if you could be known for one thing, what would that be? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Okay, sorry for the pause. Uh, but I have to say, making you limitless. Mm. Or giving you the tools to be limitless. Interesting. Interesting. I mean, consider it. Just think about it for a second. I if like we that. were to give you every single tool that we have in our tool belt, you could you could build, you can acquire a thousand a thousand businesses in your lifetime. You can build mm -hmm. multiple hundred million dollar businesses. You can have a four billion dollar portfolio of of uh, or four billion dollars of portfolio sales per year. Right? That's all possible. Yep. Now, are you willing? Are you willing? Do you have that stomach in you to to go out and get it? Do you want that for yourself? That's up to you. But we make that possible. Mm -hmm. I think vision has a lot to do with that. Um, like having a, a vision that's so magnetic that you just cannot stop yourself from moving forward. I think that that's really the difference between the entrepreneur who is comfortable at six or seven figures and the entrepreneur who is actually not even doing it for the money anymore. It's the the change that they want to bring, you know, and being a bit of a maniac in terms of, because you're going to get a lot of criticism, especially if you're on the, you know, uh, if you're putting yourself out there and you're a public figure, right? Like Elon Musk, having the, the stomach for it, for that criticism and just knowing that you have a, a bigger vision and, and, that's it. Right. Right. Honestly, to, to that point, though, I, I don't know about you, but I love talking to an entrepreneur and helping them come up with a larger vision. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that's, that's the, the most fun. That's literally the first thing I get my clients to do. Like, like see, like dream life. Like, yeah. what is it? Number one thing, yeah, like if if you had the ability to change the world, what, what changes would you make, right? Who says you can't? That's the number one thing. And then we start, we reverse engineer it. Okay, so if this is what you actually truly want, right? 
of like with with my client that uh I think I sent you that video, you know, he was making multiple seven figures a month, right? And when we talked about his business, yeah, yeah, I would like to grow the business. Okay, but what do you actually want? Well, I do a lot of business with Africa and I would like to give back to to Africa because, you know, Africa just gave us so much to to my family. You know, he was, he was running a family business. I said, great, let's do that. Right. So we started creating a, a plan for him to start helping African entrepreneurs with uh, their businesses. And guess what? His main business grew. Right. Because that thing, like when, when you're starting to give back, that thing fires you up. And I, I think like a huge sense of contribution is also needed, like big vision and also a huge, huge joy from giving back that fuels the ambition like nothing else. Right. hundred percent. I love that. Yeah. And also a lot of entrepreneurs need to go through that sort of process for themselves regularly, mm -hmm. constantly auditing that vision and large. Yep. It, seeing how to make it possible that's fantastic yeah yeah why not why not and it takes like it takes somebody external again you know not it, it, because you cannot see really your potential it takes someone to pull it out and say look this is what you're really capable of and like you're over here but you're lying to yourself saying that you're over here it doesn't make sense right and then they see it and they're like yeah and then they start implementing because they start believing just like you, you said, right? Right. Beautiful. Um, so Jose, a lot of people like to keep their goals close to their chest and that's uh, perfectly uh, fine. That's perfectly normal. But um, if it's cool, I want to ask you, like, what's one goal that you're aiming towards right now? A big goal, a bigger vision. Bigger vision. Um, I want to be the best in the world as something mm -hmm. and um and it's in business i'm still figuring out exactly where exactly what i have a feeling that it's going to be business innovation um, or innovation in general but and i'm not there's no really there's no real crown for it right mm -hmm. but it's like what it's like what they say or i don't know who said it but basically somebody said this and it stuck with me that once you once you commit yourself to a higher ideal, you become something else entirely. This might be a Batman quote. <laughs> I don't mean to. I don't mean to. Let's get Batman. us some Batman quotes. <laughs> <laughs> but but listen, it's, it 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 really hit home for me, and I was just like, listen, I'm I'm gonna I'm dedicating myself to a higher ideal. Nobody's gonna crown me, but I'm going I'm going after whatever I can. I'm going after my highest potential because I mean I only have one life. Why not aim for the highest? highest rung, like wrong highest potential mm -hmm. like again. And if I may ask you a, another question, what would you do with it once you have it? Well, two things, right? Well, give back in whatever way possible. I already know that once I reach a certain level, I'm going to be doing some sort of like 90% of my wealth of giving it away by the time I'm, by the time I die. Um, and I think other than that, just setting an example mm. and making sure to to pull others up behind me. Yeah. So again, these what we were talking about. Big vision, contribution, fuels, ambition, like nothing else. Right. Right. Also to listeners, Beautiful. like I have to, I'm gonna do this. I'm challenging each and every one of you. Think, consider what could you be the best in the world at? Mm. Set a higher goal, set your highest standard. You're worthy of it. You're capable of it. And don't be scared of it. Once you set yourself that standard, everything changes. That's powerful. That's powerful. Yeah. And also intimidating because it's like, we all, well, there's so many people in my field. Yes, but just like you said, right, there's, there's, like you said, you created a, a new field, a new industry, right? You led where, where, like, you create your own field, you're immediately the best in the world because you're the first. In a sense, one way to do it. 
right? Just like I did with my personal development in martial arts, nobody was doing that. Right. So you are the best in the world. I used to be. Now I coach. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm the best coach in the world. Beautiful. Oh. Um, you you mentioned. Uh, uh, I know you need to go. Um, but you mentioned a bit about your coaching, about starting uh coaching. Can you tell us a bit about uh a bit about that? Sure. So this is basically like a service ladder play. Uh, there's we're targeting the top of funnel. Uh, there are a lot of entrepreneurs out there who are who do feel stuck. Um, but really they're stuck because of their their weight or their health. Health mm -hmm. is the foundation of everything. Mental right. health and physical health. Um, mental usually stemming from physical. So, so what one of our offers that I've been putting together is essentially um, lose 20 pounds per month um, without exercise. Uh, it's And that's a way for entrepreneurs. And that's a way to get them back up and running, getting them that transformation so then they can start focusing on their business again um, the way that they're supposed to. Um, but then other than that, for our consultations, we tend to offer a type of coaching uh, on the back end. So we have this one out, one on one, four hour, you know, half day consult that we, it's our signature way of, of working with our clients. Um, but we know that even for those four hours, it's going to be very intense, it's going to be high standards, everything's going to be on the table, and we're going to come up with a game changing, like a, a 10x plus right. action plan, feasible action plan. But then after that, those four hours, their standards are going to drop. They're going to go back to what they're doing. They're going to maybe change a couple of things, but not everything on, in that plan is going to be implemented. So yeah, we give them essentially uh, ongoing support um, and a peer group to put themselves in where standards are at their highest, where your highest standard is expected of you at all times. Uh, and it isn't, uh, it isn't in any way toxic, right? So focusing yeah. on nurturing and supporting each other uh, to that highest level and making sure that we stay accountable to that vision that 10x or more vision that we have for ourselves very powerful does this service have a name i'm still coming up with a name right now uh, right now it's called the master entrepreneur uh it might be something else but master entrepreneur is the idea because you go from hobby project to genuine uh, business that's generating some income um, but you're still in the first couple of years or the first like one or two ventures. You aren't still, you aren't yet to master entrepreneur like Roland yep. Frazier or Tony Robbins or Elon Musk or any of these guys. So like, what do the greats do? How do you get there? Well, there's a toolkit that they use. There's a system that they use. We teach that. And that's why it's called master right. entrepreneur. I don't mind it. And this might sound cheesy. The catchphrase can be join me, master entrepreneur. It's like a, <laughs> like an acronym. <accurate>. Right. Maybe. <laughs> Beautiful. Dude, thank you so much for your time. Guys, absolutely check out Jose on um, Instagram and Facebook. You, I'm going to be linking him uh, below. And uh, yeah, maybe I hope some of you accept the challenge of uh, deciding who, like, who are you going to be the best in the world and what app, basically. I think my English is leaving my body a bit, but you guys get the idea. Yeah, no, you did great. Honestly, it was a pleasure. Uh, thanks for having me and, and hope to do this again soon. Yeah, yeah, of course. We should get you back. Maybe get your dad in as well and your mom yeah. it, or, or your grandma. That would be fun. Well, I wish she could, but she's, she's she passed. But, um, yeah, but if anything, my I'm father, she can, he can speak for her. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, that would yeah, be I'll fun. Talk. That would be fun. Yeah, yeah. Maybe have like both of you on have like a yeah, three-year conversation okay guys uh let us know if you want us to do that in the comments but we probably will so awesome thank you so much and thank uh you. i'll see you again soon